Lord, help us to see you more clearly, to love you more dearly, to follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. There is an Episcopal camp and conference center just northwest of Houston, Texas, called Camp Allen. Some of you may have perhaps been there at a retreat at some point or House of Deputies gathering for general convention. It's a large, very nice camp and conference center. They hold, they hold vestry retreats. They train deacons for across the whole church there. They hold deacon classes for training. The House of Bishops meets there regularly where all the bishops of the diocese will come and gather to do the governing work of the church and uh, will hold clergy conferences and whatnot. Outside the camp, there is a large gate blocking the way in. And there's a key box with a a little key code that you have to know the code to open the gate, and it is a closely guarded secret. What is the key code to get in? Such that when I was there on the board of the Episcopal Health Foundation, I was not allowed to have the key code to get in. Later on, when I was on the Commission on Ministry for the Diocese of Texas, I was still not allowed to have the code to get in that gate, to open that gate. I was elected to the executive board of the diocese and went to the director. I'm still not allowed to have the code to open that gate. When finally, one day, I was, the, I was actually the chaplain of Camp Allen, and finally, as the chaplain of Camp Allen, I went to the person at the desk and I said, now can I have the the code to get into the gate, please. And they finally said I was worthy of having the code. And they said, don't tell anybody. The code is one, two, three, four. <laughs> Such was the gatekeeping security at Camp Allen. I've now blown it for everybody, right? So all the Chicago people, you can now get in there. Um, I want to talk to you this morning about gates. What is a gate? Is a gate something that we use primarily to keep something out? Or is a gate that we use to have an opening to let something in? What kind of gate is Jesus saying he is this day? And maybe even more importantly for us, what kind of gate would Jesus want us to be? in this world. Now Jesus was constantly in the Gospel of John getting on the nerves of both the secular and religious authorities of his time because they were the people on the inside in authority, in, you know, at the controls of power, and they got to decide who the gate was open to and who it was closed to. And they would look out at the people on the margins and decide who was worthy of coming in. And they look over and there's this Jesus guy standing over there saying, I'm over here, the gate is open. And he wouldn't stop doing that. He would not stop letting people in that both the secular and religious authorities of his time were saying were not worthy to come in. And this guy is letting them in. But I think that is the kind of gate Jesus is. Open, inviting Telling that person that otherwise would be made to feel unworthy that you are worthy of love and you are loved. In the years leading up to World War II and in during the war itself, the German cleric Dietrich Bonhoeffer roundly criticized both the secular and religious authorities in his time at Germany, both in the Nazi party and in the Nazi-controlled German church at the time, who were in the process of systematically closing the gates to one group after another, whether you were Jewish or Romani, or homosexual, or had a medical disability, a physical or mental disability, whether you were a political dissident, the gate was closed. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer continued to stand over there to the side and say, no, we should be open, we should be embracing, extending human dignity and love to all of these people. That is who we are called to be. 
And he wouldn't stop leaving the gate open even when it was getting him into personal trouble to the point where he got arrested and was interned himself. And in his own internment, continued to be open, continued to be a way to let people into love, even to the point where he is at his own impending execution as a political dissident, and even as he's awaiting execution, gathering with others, holding their hands, and saying, you are worthy of love, and you are loved. I had a friend named Sarah who I knew in high school. She's the one I was alluding to a couple of weeks ago at a sermon. She had a friend named Emily, a young young girl with a cancer diagnosis who was in the hospital with cancer and her church had decided that she was to be cut out of their lives because she was a lesbian. No one from the church was allowed to go see her, visit her, offer her any kind of comfort. The gate was closed. Now, Emily, Emily's friend Sarah, who was already had a f- shaky faith with the church and already didn't know whether or not she believed in God, but she did believe that Emily deserved love and so was open to her and went and visited her in the hospital, provided her comfort, held her hand, said, everybody else may be cut off from you, but I want you to know you are worthy of love and you are loved. That is the church to which we are called. I have heard sermon after sermon preached on this Sunday's readings where they lift up Jesus as the idea of being a gate. Jesus standing there and deciding who is worthy of coming in and deciding who is not worthy of coming in. But have you read the gospel? The Gospel of John makes it very clear. Yes, Jesus is standing there. He's the gate. He's the way in. And he says, it's open to you all. Come in, please. I am here for you. You are worthy of being loved. You are loved. I am not blocking the way. I am inviting you in. And that is what the early church does in our Acts of the Apostles reading that we just heard. The church does the work after Jesus ascends of saying, now how are we going to be this kind of open gate for people? Should we extend, should we extend it to just, to just our, our Jewish friends, just the Jewish friends looking for, no, we should extend it to the Gentiles as well. Let's open that gate a little wider. Should we extend baptism just to the people who are filled with the Holy Spirit? No, we should open it wider. Let's offer the baptism to everyone. Constantly, who should we extend our food to? Who should we extend our clothing to? And you watch as the early church grows under this pressure of ever more opening wider, ever more embracing, being more inclusive of as many people as they can. And we are the descendants of that journey today, being called to go out and be ever more wider and inclusive in who this gate is open to. Because now we are the people on the inside. Literally, we're the ones on the inside and we get to decide if the door is locked or not. So what would it be like for us to all go out into that world and find somebody who has been pushed out into the margins? To find somebody else who has felt like the door has been shut to them and to approach them and say, you are worthy of being loved and you are loved. We do that with our meals ministry here, where instead of just handing a sack of food out a window and saying, now get out of here, instead welcoming them in and say, come sit with us. Let's eat at the table together. We do that every time somebody comes through our doors, maybe shaky in their faith, trying to figure out what they believe, and we say, you know what, come, you're you're welcome to receive with us. Come on in. A person who comes in that maybe isn't a member of St. James, maybe isn't an Episcopalian. And we say, you know what? Peace be with you anyway. You are worthy of being loved and you are loved. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was a gate. He was the kind of open gate that showed everybody that they were welcome to come in. Let us do the same. Thanks be to God. 
Amen.